Hi, I'm Donald Osborne, and welcome to this latest in our series of virtual seminars from the Audrain Automobile Museum. We're here today at Audrain Park Place in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, to celebrate an anniversary, the 60th birthday of the Jaguar, yes, three syllables, E-Type. And to join me in that celebration is a man very well suited to help celebrate this anniversary, Dean Cusano, the co-founder of Motor Cars Incorporated in Plainville, Connecticut. And Dean, your life is Jaguars. And pretty much, yeah. How did that happen? Well, it started when I was a kid. I had a car family that I grew up in, and uh, my brother brought home an E-Type when I was young, and from when I was 16 years old, it was Jaguar E-Type. Yep. And I've uh, been restoring and servicing and judging these cars my whole life. So this car, how old were you when you first saw an E-Type? I was 17. 17 years old. Mm -hmm. and. The remarkable thing about the Jaguar E-Type, this car was introduced in 1961 and an evolution of the Jaguar racing cars, sure. uh, the C-Type and the D-Type, mm -hmm. of course, which won Le Mans three times, and designed by Malcolm Sayer. And this is one of the almost perfect design. If, if, you, if you didn't know anything about a sports car and you were a little kid doodling, you'd probably draw an E-Type. Yeah, it's your typical round, smooth line, but it was designed by an air, a person who designed airplanes, so that's... Perfect, makes perfect sense. Malcolm Sire, he knew how to make the car go through the air. And one of the things that's so amazing about the E-Type too, part of its romantic allure for me, is the wonderful story of the introduction at the Geneva Auto Show. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were so excited about getting the car there, they were doing some road tests in, in the UK, and they had a roadster already in Geneva that they had mm -hmm. to display, and they wanted to get the fixed head coupe there. And the driver drove it all night from mm -hmm. the UK to get it to Geneva and arrived a half an hour before the unveiling. And that wonderful car, HP 9600, yep. is just, to me, the in incredible romantic image, the opalescent silver gray and this incredible shape. Well, what better way to introduce a car to the world when you, the boss calls up Norman Dewis and says, get that car here, and he drives through the night in the rain from England down to Switzerland, and they put it on the showroom floor dirty. <laughs> And uh, I mean, it was a great way to introduce the car. Everybody knew that this car just drove at excessive speeds all night long and made it to the show on time. It was, it was, it was like Broadway. Now, one of the things, of course, um, we're all familiar with the great manner in which manufacturers prepared cars for road tests. And uh, the E-Type is quite legendary because it was tested at 150 miles per hour. And whether they're 150 mile per hour cars or not, I'll ask you that question. <laughs> is it a real 150 mile per hour car? Oh, I don't know. They run out of gear probably around 125 or so. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not used to having the motors rev that high these days. You know, we can do 80 miles an hour in a modern car at 1500 RPM. When you're in an E-Type and it's at 4,000, 4,500 at 110 miles an hour, you feel like you're hurting it. But that's what it's designed for. These are really fast cars. Probably too much time, probably two or three years goes between the time that I get to drive an E-Type. And every time I do, I am amazed at how fast they are and how yeah. well they handle. It's, it's, it's absolutely astonishing. The combination of speed and chassis capability is something that makes the E-Type really special. Oh, for sure. I mean, the early cars, driving a vintage car, you have to get used to body roll and, you know, they're not as rigid. Um, but, you know, this car is being a, a monocute body with a tubular chassis, basically a race car that was modified for the street. Absolutely, a very capable car. And uh, one of the things, of course, which is also very interesting is E-Type versus XKE. Mm -hmm. It was introduced in Europe, of course, as the E-Type mm -hmm. because people understood quite clearly that it was a successor in terms of feeling and spirit and engineering and design of the C-Type and D-Type. Mm -hmm. But for the U.S. market, Jaguar's most important export market, of course, the XK120, XK140, XK150 were so incredibly popular, mm -hmm. and this was the successor to the 150, so therefore they thought it was an XKE. XKE. Mm -hmm. That's really not the name of it. Exactly, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a very funny thing. Uh, of course, you know, you speak to uh, European friends, or, or especially British friends, mm -hmm. they say, oh yeah, my XKE, say, excuse me? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, now we've got here sort of a, a flight, as it were, of, of, of E-types, and uh, it's very exciting, and of course, one of the things which is, is so wonderful is that no manufacturer has ever built a Series 1 anything, because of course it's always mm -hmm. retrospective. Mm -hmm. But tell us what we have here in front of us, this wonderful green fixed head coupe. Well, we, um, this car here is a 63, and we tried to bring cars that could show the, the key differences between the three series. And Jaguar, you know, in the United States, everybody wants to put a year on a car and define it for its year. But in the UK, these cars were, they were designed as an evolution when they changed things. 
So a 63 car, which would have shell seats and a metal dash, for instance, in a certain VIN number, they change it to a non-metal uh, dash. So it's the evolution in, the, in Europe between a Series 1 and a Series 3, as we call it. But this demonstration is more Series 1, 2, and 3. And it's a very interesting thing too, Dean, the fact that, generally speaking, in the collector car market, the first examples and the last examples are usually the most valuable. Mm -hmm. But I think, and I know that you will, you will uh, back this up, each of the series of the E-Type has their own particular appeal. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, I mean, everybody talks about an E-Type and the first question is, does it have cover headlamps? And the second question would be, does it, does it have wire wheels? You know, Jaguar had wire wheels in some, most years and then they also had what they call the road wheel. I particularly like road wheels. Um, but the covered headlamps, honestly, 70% of the light stays behind the glass and you really can't see where you're going. So as the evolution made the car a little less beautiful, it made it more usable. And, and, and you know, it was more saleable that way. Well, one of the things, uh, I was just uh, speaking last night to a group from the Porsche Club. Yes, mm -hmm. I know we can mention Porsche while we're talking about Jaguar. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about development and evolution mm -hmm. and the fact that the first 911s, really great cars, however, they quickly realized that they needed to lengthen the wheelbase to make yeah. it more stable. And just as the very first E-types had flat floors, and were very different in terms of a driving environment. Mm -hmm. Now those cars, of course, as, as we just mentioned, are very valuable and sought after because they built so few of them, but what is the driving experience like in one of those versus one of these? Well, an early car would be flat floor, it'd be a 3.8, uh, it'd have shell seats like this, and it had a Moss gearbox. In Europe, they pretty much called it a three-speed with low. In the United States market, they wanted it to be a four-speed. Well, first gear wasn't synchronized. So it's a much more romantic feeling when you're in a flat floor E-Type because it's not as comfortable. You really can't go into first gear without grinding it. Um, the shell seats are beautiful, but they're not as comfortable as the, the later seats. So the flat floor car is a little bit challenging, but I love it because it's an experience. It's, it's the romanticness of what the car was. The one question that I have, and I'd love to, to go back and ask uh, William Lyons, why they actually switched from the outside latches which to me works so much better than these fiddly things that they actually went to, which That's are true. so annoying to me. But Well, the outside latches were difficult because you had to line them up all the time because the bonnet would flex. Right. Um, but it also had to do with safety because later on in years they were worried about them catching things. So the inside latch is also more secure when you lock. You couldn't lock an outside bonnet latch car. Ha! <laughs> which is another thing that we don't think about so much in, the, uh, in America mm -hmm. about the fact that you, know, you need to secure small things like you know batteries and all those yeah. things that somebody could actually uh, walk off with. Now, also let's talk a little bit about nomenclature. Mm -hmm. um, in the XK uh, series of the 1950s, uh, it's very, very well set. When you get to the E-Type, it gets a little less rigid, but mm -hmm. these cars are properly fixed head coupes and open two-seaters, correct? Open touring sports. Open touring sports. Yep, in, in England it's called an open touring sports. Over here they call it an open two-seater, but OTS really means open touring sports. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And a fixed head coupe, of course, and then they had a drop head in the right. XKs. Which the, is a little more luxurious. Well, what a drop head means is that the, wind, the A posts are fixed to the body, whereas a Roadster on the XKs, the A post was screwed to the body. Let's take a look at our next car, a Roadster, um, as it were, and this is a really beautiful car. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I love colors. Yeah. What is this color game? This is called opalescent golden sand. Oh. It's a special order color. They had standard colors, and then if you wanted to order a car and wait for it a little bit, you could. there were four or five special order colors, and this is opalescent gold and sand. It's beautiful. The opalescent colors are just absolutely amazing. And again, the characteristic of the color on the shape of the car mm -hmm. is something that, you know, I'll, I'll just stand on my soapbox for a second and talk about modern cars, and I don't understand how designers can, 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 can deal with the matte finishes. It's all about the reflections on the car and, and how they show the shape of the car. Can you imagine? One of these, a matte gray. Well, it's a, look at this car. There's not one flat panel square inch on this car. There's no, not one inch of this car that, that is flat. Every panel moves. Yeah. And this car is also great. It's got white wall tires. Yeah. And a lot of people may think, a Jaguar E-Type white wall tires? But you know, all the ads for the US market when the mm -hmm. cars introduced showed the car with white wall tires. And I think it really is a great look. Well, this year shouldn't really have white walls. They had white walls 61, 62, and into 63. But when we built this car, and we originally put the black walls on it, it was missing something. And these Dunlop, little skinny Dunlop bias ply tires, you know, I was talking about romance before, you know, when they're squealing and they're soft and it just makes you feel like you're, you're privileged to be in the car. And we put the white walls on it, it made it pop. So this year really shouldn't have the white walls, but it goes with this car, it looks great. Now, we saw in the uh, fixed head coupe 
the shell seats. Now we see the second iteration of the seats. So mm -hmm. tell us a little about, about uh, those, Dave. Well, these are more like a 65 seat. Uh, they're more, they call them a safety seat. The shell seat is, some people think they're comfortable. I don't really fit in them very well. Um, they're more beautiful though, you know, but again, you give up a little beauty for a little bit of safety. There's more support in the back. I think they were concerned about if the car were to get in a rear end collision. And these are also reclining seats, correct? Yes, yep, the they have a lap. Yep, and they have evolved through the years because the Department of Transportation in the United States started being worried about that the seats had to lock back, the seat belt had to work with the seat, and Jaguar did their best to keep up with all the rule changes. And we talk about continuous changes and changes during um, uh, the construction of the cars, and we talked about the outside bonnet yep. latch and, and the flat floors, but there was also the louvers changed in the hood as well. Yeah, everybody talks about is it a drop-in louver car, and you know the original cars had a drop-in louver. There was a there was a crease all the way around here, and this was a separate piece. And the reason why they did that is they didn't have a brake large enough to create the louvers in the center section of the bonnet, so they just made a square hole, created louvers, and they spot welded them up in. And it's funny that that ends up being a a positive. Um, option for, for value, <laughs> and it is kind of cool. My race car has drop-in louvers, um, but later on when they were able to figure out how to do the louvers in the center section, they didn't do the drop-in anymore. And it's also something that uh, is quite interesting. These cars, you have, you have restored, you maintain these cars on a regular basis. A lot of your clients, you yourself drive the cars and All use time. them. Now, there are louvers in the hood. There's a nice exhaust vent in the hood. However, these cars are, have a notorious reputation mm -hmm. for overheating. What, what do you think the Jaguar could have done the original design to increase airflow under the hood? Well, they designed them in England and it wasn't as hot in England as in the United States. You know, when you take a car and you start driving it down to Florida, you're not going to make it. And even though they vented the air out, there's, a, there's only one size entrance going in. So on the Series 1 cars with a smaller mouth, they could never cool the cars down. So they went to the Series 2 and they made the mouth bigger, added another fan. It's really not a problem. If the car is serviced right and the fluids are right, they're totally usable. That's exactly what I wanted yep. to, to you, you to say, because one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about collector cars, collector cars sometimes get a reputation for a certain fault, mm -hmm. which almost always, not always, relates to, to their use. Exactly. The fact that cars like to be used, like to be driven, and especially a car like the E-Type, which is so wonderful to drive, to have it sit in the garage is just sort of a sad thing, mm -hmm. and it's unfair to the car mm -hmm. and its reputation if it's not driven and, and properly maintained. I talk to my customers all the time. You know, I tell them, take it out and run it, run it hard. The car is designed to be run hard. You don't need to baby an E-Type. You know, it's like early classic cars like Packard's. They go up the side of a building. They're, you know, they're so rugged and people treat them dainty. <laughs> um, these cars were race cars and you have to run them. And then if anything's going to go wrong, it services it to the top and we'll service it when we figure out what it is. Now we're going to go from this exquisitely restored car to something rather different, something that we really love to see, an original car that shows its life. Let's take a look. And Dean, now we're standing next to a car that is very different from the uh, opalescent uh, sand car that we saw before. And it's equally wonderful in a totally mm. different way. It's a wonderful original car. Let's talk about this a bit. What, what does a car like this tell us about E-types and how they're made and how they've been used? Well, you know, I, most car, car guys, you ask them, they would love to have a car with patina, an original car. There's a lot of beauty in an original car. I've known this car for a while. Um, the current owner is a very good friend of mine, and the owner before him was a very good friend of mine. Um, this is a 64 car. And we brought this car to show that even though it's still a 3.8 and it still has shell seats, they changed the console to an upholstery console. And there's about a half a dozen, maybe a dozen changes between a 3.8 and 61 and 2, 3, up to a 64, a transition to the 4.2. Um, but this car, I mean, this is just this is awesome, just the way it is. I wouldn't touch a thing. It's got the Talbot mirrors. A lot of these cars came from England without mirrors on them and the dealer installed the mirrors and the dealer would install the radio. Um, and that's why mirrors are mounted in so many different places. This car has an antenna in the front. Sometimes you'll see them in the back. It's whatever the dealer wanted to do. But this car has six inch wheels on it, a little bit bigger tire and a 3.8 Talbot mirrors. I mean, you know, that, that's it right there. That car is beautiful. And one of the things also, we talked about the improvements as they rolled along and what makes something interesting to a collector versus mm -hmm. to someone driving a car. You think, wow, that, that wonderful uh, 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 chrome, crinkle chrome console is so cool. Mm -hmm. But in an open car, the reflections Absolutely. must have been horrifying. Mm -hmm. So this is a much more practical application of interior design for the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, depending on what you're looking for in a car and what you want the car to do for you, if you're going to drive the car, uh, an open top car, a lot with the top down, 
then probably this a car like this mm -hmm. would be more practical for you. In the earlier cars, they didn't have visors. Um, most people, I, myself, my eyes are right in line with the visors. They added the visors as a safety thing uh, in 65, coming into 66, so a true 3.8 car wouldn't have visors. So this is the car. If you're going to run a Roadster, this, this would be the one you'd enjoy the most right here. One of the other things which I also love about E-Types are the three windshield wipers. When yeah. I was a kid, I thought that was the coolest, weirdest thing I'd ever seen in my life. But you know, you think about it, and they're actually thinking about the fact that, first of all, obviously these cars are born in England where it rains all the time, mm. but actually visibility for using the car. They could have put two windshield wipers on and then you would have had no coverage and a car that you would not want to drive at 90 miles per hour in the rain. Well, you know, we're talking in the 60s. This is probably one of the most curved windshields that anybody created in the 60s. Triplex made this windshield and they couldn't get a wiper blade to get the whole windshield and the windshield's so short. They couldn't make any blades that could make a big enough swing. So they've got three. None of them work very well, but when you add them <laughs> up, it, it pretty much cleans the windshield. Well, you, you, have, you have a better chance. Yeah, a little bit better than having two. Now, let's go back to a fixed head and take a look at that. Okay. Once again, a fixed head. Once again, a wonderful opalescent color. And now we've gone into the late 60s. Mm -hmm. Tell us what we have here, Dean. This is late 66, actually a 67 car by the United States Standard. A wonderful car. Set up a little bit for competition. Has outside laced wheels, which I love. Um, you can see, obviously, it has numbers on it. Um, but a wonderful car, opalescent light gray with red leather. Beautiful, beautiful Jaguar right here. It's so funny. Um, we talk about the fact that of color, and I love color. Mm -hmm. For some strange reason, almost all the cars I have are this color mm -hmm. combination, gray with a red interior. It's just so incredibly classic. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the other thing, that these cars look so good in every color the Jaguar offered. I think they, they, they really had a great eye for matching color and form. And we were talking about the, the subtle differences between cars. I mean, it gets to the point where we mentioned the fact that this car does not have a glove box, but mm -hmm. cars just after this would Started have, to a, have glove a glove box. box yeah. And you know, because the glove of the, box door. Because of the, uh, sorry, yes, they mm -hmm. have a glove box, just mm -hmm. not a door. So your gloves would fly out at yeah, speed. <laughs> <laughs> out the back of the car. Exactly. Um, but you have been a Jaguar club judge for years and years and years yeah. at the highest level. And it must be, an, it's an incredible challenge to be a judge anyway. It's, one it's a curse. Why I, I avoid it whenever whenever. It's asked. a curse to be a judge sometimes. <laughs> but for cars yeah. like these, where you have so many running changes, what do you actually do in terms of looking at something which is, quote, correct for a certain car? Well, you know, luckily Jaguar Clubs of North America is a very strong sanctioning body. And they have judges guides that I have to say are very, very easy to use. And if you're a judge, even if you're a moderately knowledgeable judge, if you follow judges guide, it's like high school, the, the answers are always in the book. So you, you can see something and you say, gee, no, that doesn't look quite right. But the answer is always in the judging guide. And, and you know, being part of that whole network of judging and, and Concor and setting up who's the best car in the country, which one's the best one in North America, you have to pay attention to those different subtle changes. And you know, it just takes time. And the more you look at them, you, you know what to look for if you have to figure out which car is better than the other. But like I was saying earlier, the cars, it's more of an evolution. It isn't necessarily each year has a specific change. So you got to get used to it, it's hard. And the entire, what I consider the minefield of series one, series one and a half, mm -hmm. and, and, and then finally series two, mm -hmm. for someone who's interested in, in buying one of these cars and keeping it, preserving it, does it really make a difference which of the ones they have? And how would you okay. guide somebody to say, well, I want an E-Type, so which one should I buy? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a series one and a half. That's an American <laughs> slang term. It's just the evolution of how the car changed. Um, a lot of people would say that a Series 1 that doesn't have covered headlights could be a Series 1.5, but they're Series 1.5 with two carburetors. Some have three carburetors. Depends if they were shipped to Canada. So there's a lot of changes. But to answer your question, it depends what you're going to do with the car. If you want to show it and you want the most beautiful car, you need a 3.8. Um, but you're not going to be able to use that car and get stuck on a Long Island freeway with that car. So if you're going to be driving the car, you should switch up to a Series 2. Um, series 2 has a larger mouth, two fans, two carburetors instead of three. They are more startable in the morning, a little less problematic. Basically the same car though. So like I, my answer is, depending on what you're gonna do with the car, in my opinion, is what I would tell the person to try to look for. And what really makes me happy about standing next to this car is as you mentioned, the roundels and the numbers. In fact, this car is taken on a rally. Mm -hmm. And E-Type is a great rally yeah, car. Yeah, it's what it's built for. Yeah. Yep. So now let's take the next step in the progression. Now mm -hmm. we'll see some, some real changes. Yep, we're gonna go to a series two. So Dean, now we've taken a step. 
This is yeah. an official Series 2. Series e 2. We took two steps because in between there was a 68, which was a transitional year. We didn't bring one of those today. Um, but this is a straight up Series 2, 1970. This is a beautiful car here. So there's quite a few changes between a 67 and a straight up Series 2. 68 was kind of in the middle. Um, but most of the changes became because the cars were more for the United States market and the Department of Transportation had a whole list of things that they just required. Obviously, open headlights. Um, on a Series 2, the headlights are moved up and out so the light can go in both directions. On a 68 car, the light is much lower so the light only goes straight forward. And you can see better than when there's glass on it, but not much. This is much, much better right here. A Series 2 has a m larger mouth, a same radiator but two fans, and they tend not to run as warm. A Series 2 has two carburetors instead of three, a little bit less horsepower and less compression. We're starting to worry about emissions now coming into 68, 69, and 70. They're not that much slower. Um, the 3.8 actually is actually, in my opinion, the most fun to drive, which would be an early 60s car. Mm -hmm. But there's quite a few changes in the, in the Series 2 car, Donald, and I don't know how, how many days you have to go over them, but <laughs> there's, there's probably 10 or 12 of them that are, that are critical. Yeah, well, let's talk about some of those, Dean, and also about the fact that as Jaguar was going through this period of U.S. federal regulations, mm -hmm. I happen to think that they actually handled it a lot better than a lot of other manufacturers did, especially for a high-performance car. Well, they're a small company. They're building cars as fast as they can. For the first time in their life, they were selling them as, as, as quickly as they built them. They were sold. They were going to the United States as fast as they could, and they were, it was their glory time through the Series 2 years. And, but at the same time, like you say, they had to deal with the, the list of things that the U.S. market required, the Department of Transportation. So I can go through a bunch of them. Uh, one is these not very pretty side lights. Right. Um, they're such a beautiful round car, and they got the side lights stuck to it. The parking lights are bigger. The tail lights are bigger. There were no bumper certifications for Series 2. But if you notice, the mirrors changed. Uh, it had to be a breakaway mirror starting in 69. So if you were to get into an accident and your head hit the mirror, you, you couldn't get hurt by the mirror. The earlier cars, they're prettier, the mirrors on that stock. The reason why they have the stock is it holds the top chrome down so when the top latches to it, it doesn't pull the chrome off the top. But if you notice on a Series 2, the stock is black for glare, like you were talking about the dash. And on a Series 1, it's chrome. Another thing about Series 2 that a lot of, we go to shows and a lot of restores and people don't realize, and they get it wrong, is the Series 2, the steering wheel is not polished, it's brushed. Because when you're in that roadster and it's a sunny day and that steering wheel is in your eyes, it's, it, it's amazing how it catches your eye sometimes, like a diamond ring. So, brushed steering wheel, breakaway um, mirror, a lot more lights on a Series 2, and there's a lot of changes inside too. All the Series 2s came with seat belts, all the seats lock back, um, a locking boot, finally, so you could lock the car, because this is not very secure right here. <laughs> um, the Series 2 is a much more usable car, equally as beautiful, just beautiful in a little bit different way. And that brings us exactly to the points that you were making earlier. Each of the Series has their specific discrete appeal, mm -hmm. and many of these changes, again, we often think, I often think, I'll be, I'll be totally honest, that a lot of the government mandated changes took away a lot from the cars. However, again, as I said, Jaguar really used those in a way that frankly make the Series 2 a much more usable car. They figured out how to do it, cars. make everybody happy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, um, our next step is a really big one mm -hmm. and really sort of transformed the entire character of the car. And a lot of people think maybe it should have been given a different name. Who knows? Let's take well, a look at the next step, which is really dramatic. So we have here the beginning of the last series of the Jaguar E-Type and something very, very different. In some ways, perhaps, is this pointing towards the XJS that would follow? Oh, absolutely. That's a, that's a perfect tie-in. Um, well, the reason why the V12 is obviously a larger and bigger car is because the motor is a lot larger and bigger, but it started becoming a, a grand touring car instead of an open sports car. Um, so what I brought here is a 73 2 plus 2, and we hadn't really touched upon 2 plus 2s. But for the American market, Jaguar designed 2 plus 2s all the way back to 1966. They made a 4.2 liter 2 plus 2 six cylinder. Uh, you could even get that car in automatic, which again, uh, why would they put it in automatic? They're obviously appealing to the United States market. So they made 2 plus 2 series 1, series 2, and series 3. The series 3, 2 plus 2. This is one of the last series 3, 2 plus 2s. I brought this car because I wanted to demonstrate the differences in the bumpers. Um, they Obviously, we all know there were bumper laws started coming in in 68, 69, and 70. So when the V12 car came out, it's a lot heavier car, bigger, wider. And 71 and 2, they got away without having big, heavy bumpers. But in 73, the Department of Transportation said, you need 5-mile-an-hour bumpers. So this is a one-year-only bumper 
1973, the chrome ring, and then behind it there's a shock absorber integrated into the body of the car, and it's supposed, I think the, the rule was it couldn't have more than an X dollar amount of damage to the car if it had an impact of up to five miles an hour in this particular year. It really didn't work because the cowl would go up over the, the bonnet would go up over the cowl and damage the car, and there's your, there would go way over the expense. But it was an attempt at trying to, again, modify the cars for the Department of Transportation. There's a lot of things you'll see different in the Series 2 and 3, the wiper arms are now burnished so that they're, they don't have any glare. Um, a 2 plus 2 does not have the post on the windshield. You have more visibility. So and we also have two wipers. Now two we wipers. Have a taller windshield. Because this has a taller windshield. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. See? You're listening. <laughs> um, this is a great car. Uh, it's a nice 2 plus 2. This is a manual shift 2 plus 2. Again, for the United States market, most of them were automatics with air conditioning. Um, the reason why the XJS happened which I, is my personal favorite Jaguar, I have quite a few XJSs, is because they just couldn't get these cars to go through the bumper standards. The car behind me is a 74, and that, this is a one year only bumper here. So this is, this is a very, very late car. So I wanted to demonstrate the differences between Jaguar doing the best they could to try to meet the Department of Transportation standards. Let's also talk about the shape of the two plus two, because for a while, it was very controversial when mm -hmm. it was introduced. A lot of Jaguar purists thought, oh my God, what have they done with the shape and why do we need to have, this is a sports car, why do we need to have right. back seats? But this is much more in line with the Grand Tours, as you mentioned, like mm -hmm. the Aston Martins and, and some of the uh, Maseratis. So they were two plus twos. And so Jaguar saw an opportunity to really stretch the market a bit. And again, I think that they did now in retrospect, a very, very good job of adapting the shape uh, to it. I think that time has, has proven the friend of the 2 plus 2. Well, exactly what you just said. When it first came out, everybody thought it was horrible. Um, but honestly, right now, 2 plus 2s are, are very sought after. First of all, they're comfortable. I can fit in it without having to bend my head to get in. And, and they're tight and they don't rattle. And the, and the shape, although it's higher and longer, it's still obviously an E-type. And um, right now, the last two years, the value of 2 plus 2s has risen substantially because it's a more substantial car. You really can't fit in the back seat. It would be a bet. <laughs> but it is a two plus two, and I think the insurance companies got involved too because because it had back seats, and all of a sudden it wasn't a sports car, and exactly. I think that helped a lot too. And let's talk a little bit about the driving characteristics, mm -hmm. the difference between the sixes and the twelve. Huge difference, huge difference. A whole diff is like a whole different car. I love V12 cars, um, especially an open car like this car. It's all torque. Not necessarily fast, mm -hmm. not and really much faster than a six-cylinder car, but all torque and when they're set up right, they're just wonderful. F fully synchronized gearbox, power steering, all the cars have power steering. I can fit in the car. It's much more comfortable. A Series 3, in my opinion, is a wonderful experience. It isn't romantic like a 3.8 Roadster, but it's much more comfortable. Well, let's see the romantic version of the V12 now, this wonderful <laughs> Roadster that we're next to. So Jaguar continued to meet the regulations hurled at them by the U.S. government um, with the Series 3 cars. And I think that this car, once again done in my favorite colors of silver over red, is such a great example of, of just the triumph of the Series 3 cars. Absolutely. This is, this is the end of it here. Jaguar threw everything they had at this E-Type. Uh, this is just a beautiful example, opalescent light silver with red leather. And this is a 74 car, very close to the end of the run. Uh, you can see the larger bumpers. Again, there's a big shock absorber behind that bumper trying to get, I don't know really if the regulation was 10 mile an hour by, by 1974 or not, but it was more than five. And again, they just couldn't do it. The damage would happen up in the cowl, and that's why the evolution of the XJS happened. The XJS is basically a Series 3 E-type with a un, up, stuck up into a one-piece body without a tubular frame. It has the same, pretty much the same dimensions as this car. And XJS, that's a whole other story. A wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful touring car. Um, we'll, we'll get together with you, Dean, and, and mm -hmm. do an XJS uh, story. I had uh, two XJSs, and Great I absolutely car. love them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, again, we talk about these cars and their usability. By the time you get to a Series 3 Roadster like this, and this is an automatic or manual. There's a four-speed. Four-speed, which, again, is extremely sought after. Mm -hmm. And I think, though, although, you know, a lot of people talk about the automatics. With the characteristics, as you mentioned before, of the torque of the, of the V12, the automatic suits it quite well. A Series 3 with an automatic is a wonderful car, a yeah. wonderful touring car. Yeah, Borg Warner in there. It's a little clunky shifting, but it, they're, they're like a bulldog. They last forever. The automatic Series 3 type Roadster is a wonderful touring car, but you know the purists want to have the, the four-speed. But it's such an interesting thing, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, that normally sort of the collector rule is the first and the last mm -hmm. are the most valuable and interesting. 
And I think that it's still true with the E-Type mm -hmm. because the very first cars appeal to a certain aesthetic and a certain mindset historically. And the Series 3 cars appeal to a completely different but equally related because it's all about the driving experience of these cars. Mm -hmm. And with the evolution of a car like this, it's like a painter. Sometimes you'll love a painter's early works and you think, well, he or she developed and I don't like the late stuff so much. But with the E-Type, there's something to love through its entire lifetime. Uh, and for different reasons. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And the Series 3 E-Type, this car being one of the last cars, I mean, it's just so beautiful and it does everything it's supposed to do. I, I stand back and look at these cars. I can't believe Jaguar, such a small company, was able to build this complex vehicle, 12-cylinder, front engine, rear wheel drive, 12-cylinder, four-speed platform. It's the best touring GT platform that you could possibly you know, put out to the public. And one of the things, of course, today that a lot of us certainly here in the U.S. don't think about is the fact that Jaguars were always built to a price mm -hmm. because they basically competed with the cars two levels above, like an Aston Martin. Which Half the money of a Ferrari. Exactly. And um, with, with all of the performance, the usable performance that you needed and could use. Yeah, so you brought these wonderful cars here. We haven't seen one of them, and I think that you were saving sort of your favorite car emotionally for last. Well, you know, everybody has a favorite. Of course, Sandy is one of my own cars, and I, and I love that car because of the uniqueness of it. But in this group here, my favorite car has to be the triple blue car, 1967 Roadster, and his name is John Sacramone. Let's talk about that and the car. So, Dean, you mentioned the name of this car, and, and again, that, that's something that also speaks to the relationship yeah. that people have with their E-types. So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, people, people kid me about the fact that we name our cars, but at our shop, we have so many E-types, it gets confusing sometimes. If you have four or five red cars or three or four blue cars, and you tell your mechanic to go grab the car, which one, the red car? So we name them all, and we kind of have fun with it, and we name them after Sopranos characters. And we've gone through, there's about 80 different Sopranos characters. We've gone through most of the list over the last couple of years. This is John Sacramone, this car here. Um, and this is one of my favorite cars. It belongs to a very good friend of mine. We built this car bumper to bumper from a bunch of boxes. Uh, and it's just beautiful. It's triple blue. Uh, it's a heritage certified car. It's been judged. It's a show winning car. Uh, it's a 67 car. And I just wanted to um, show the motor in this car because these early cars, you know, late now, Donald, we were talking cars, everything has plastic covers and you really can't see anything. Right. And other than Corvette putting a clear bubble in the, in the hood of their new car, the manufacturers don't really show off the motors, not in the United States anyways, unless it's a Pagani or something like that. But these cars, the motor was made to be beautiful polished components. So, I mean, the Series 1, 2, and 3, the motors are so substantially different, but these early, these 4.2 liter motors are just a beautiful thing to look at. They're a work of art. Let's take a look, Dean. I mean, this was a time when the motors were supposed to be beautiful, and everything's aluminum, so why not polish it? Uh, this is pretty much a representation of how it left the factory. Maybe not quite as polished, um, but beautiful polished cam covers. There's a double overhead cam, 4.2 liter, a uh, straight six cylinder with an aluminum head and a cast iron block. The yeah. XK, uh, first of all, all straight sixes are beautiful engines. That's the truth. A double like overhead cam straight six is a beautiful engine. Mm -hmm. And this particular engine, I mean, what this represented when the XK120 was introduced mm -hmm. is just absolutely remarkable. And the development of this engine, the flexibility of this engine is, is, is legendary. It's a reason why this, this, this engine and, and, this, and these cars are just so incredibly priced. It definitely was a success. They ran this motor all the way up to 1987 in the United States, and in, in Canada they ran it all the way up to 1990, the same exact block. Um, of course, there were some internal changes, but you know it has a lot of torque. It wasn't hard to manufacture. Uh, it could be made with regular lathes and normal processes without a lot of computerization. So it was a really good car, a uh, really good motor. It had chain-driven cams instead of uh, timing belts. There wasn't a lot of internal service needed. Yep. Again, as we said, these are cars meant to be driven, and when they're properly maintained and used, mm -hmm. they're an absolute joy. Absolutely. Dean, I am so happy that you were able to join us today, bringing these cars. We want to thank the uh, Jaguar Club of North America, the New England uh, Division, that, uh, that supplied these cars. And also, let's talk a bit about a foundation that is mm -hmm. very, very close to your heart and also helped make this possible today. Well, thank you for having us, Donald. Um, you know, of course, this was originally started and brought to my attention by the Jaguar Association of New England. And then um, we ended up bringing some cars from our shop, some of the uh, members' cars, to create a display to try to show the differences in the models. Um, I um, am from Connecticut, Plainville, Connecticut. My company's Motor Cars Incorporated. Uh, but what really made this happen is, is a foundation called the Hometown Foundation. 
we do a cause-related uh, show in Farmington, Connecticut called the Dream Ride Experience. And the, the, the transportation and the time that it took in order to get these vehicles here was donated by the Hometown Foundation because we want people to know what we do. Um, we do cause-related shows for people with intellectual disabilities, uh, people that um, need uh, hospitals. We buy police dogs for police um, departments, support the veterans. Any cause that needs to be supported, the Hometown Foundation is always there. So I want to mention that I'm proud to be a part of it. And without their um, input here, we wouldn't have been able to transport these beautiful cars here from Plainville, Connecticut. And some of them are from uh, Jane, the Jaguar Association of New England. It was great to be able to show um, the beautiful story of the Jaguar series. And I'd also like to say, again, about the Dream Ride. It's so wonderful because not only are these rides given to, to children that mm -hmm. really this is a life-changing experience for, for children who have illnesses, but it also, again, reinforces the fact that these cars are meant to be used and shared. Absolutely. And that, that, that's what it's all about. You know, I've, I've spent my whole life doing cause-related shows, and I, you know, it has culminated to being involved in creating the Dream Show itself. And, um, you know, it's humbling, but I see the changes that it does uh, for these children and these people with disabilities. And it's awesome to be able to use cars and the beauty of cars to be a mechanism to be able to do fundraising and create awareness for people that, that need to be shown to people and be aware that these people need help and we, there's a cause and people have to step up and help them out. Well, thanks so much, Dean. Thanks, Tom. Absolute pleasure being yeah, with you. It was a great day. And uh, thank you so much for joining us here in the Audrain Museum Network. Watch out for our next uh, virtual seminars, which will be coming up soon. And of course, for the Audrain Newport Concours and Motor Week coming in September, September 30th through October 3rd this year. Thank you very much. See you then.